Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Grow with Katie live here at Homestead Gardens, actually virtually at Homestead Gardens. I am your guest, Katie Dubow, and I'm very excited to be joined by two of my friends and horticulturists and dear experts. Uh, actually, I guess they're plant experts, <laughs> but talking today about creating deer-resistant gardens. So let me bring in Ruth Clausen and Greg Tepper. We've got two excellent guests today, so I'm really excited. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Thank you. Hi. Hi. We're so excited to have you here. And we have something to celebrate. You both have co-authored a new book, let's bring it up, Deer Resistant Native Plants for the Northeast, which is extremely specific, but very relevant to our audience today. So that came out recently, didn't it? It came out a couple of months ago, yep. Congratulations. Now, Ruth, you. you've written another book on deer, haven't you? Yeah. Yes, I have. I wrote a book called 50 Beautiful Deer Resistant Plants. And that's been out uh, quite a long time now, actually several years, but I'm glad to say that it's still selling well because the deer are still reproducing themselves. <laughs> yes, they are. And that's what we're going to get to get into today is to talk about the deer in our backyards, how we can possibly live with them, pick maybe some plants that they don't tend to like, although I think Ruth and Greg will tell you that if they're hungry enough, they'll eat something. Um, I was shopping for rain plants this week. Rain pants this weekend. <laughs> rain pants this weekend. And um, most of them were water resistant. Now we all know what a water resistant coat or pant will do. So I think, you know, these are not deer repellent plants. You know, these are not foolproof, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Why they're called deer resistant, how we can keep them away, how you can go pick up your plants at Homestead this week, because a lot of the plants that Greg and Ruth recommend in their book are actually at Homestead Garden. So, and they're for right, our region. Right. They're for right. our region. So that's wonderful. So yeah. before we jump in, let me ask, we've got Peggy Ann Montgomery tuning in. I know who is a dear friend of both of oh, you. Yeah. Hi, Peggy Ann. Oh. <laughs> um, let, please let us know where you guys are tuning in from and if you need more specific recommendations. So we'd love um, to provide those for you. So first let's do some bios. Ruth, you live in garden in Delaware and you've written the, the book we just mentioned, this deer resistant native plants mm -hmm. plus 50 beautiful deer resistant plants. Plus you've written many, many, many other things, articles, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> um, essential perennials and proven winners garden book. And Greg, you've been around the public garden block. You've worked in a number of public gardens. Um, and you recently helped with the Delaware is it the Coastal Botanic Gardens? What's that called? It's uh, Delaware Botanic Gardens. At Delaware the Botanic Gardens. Yep. And now you work at the, which cemetery? I know I should. So it's, it's, it's actually two properties, but one company. It's, it's Laurel Hill and West Laurel Hill Cemeteries. And both properties combined are a 257 acre arboretum. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And so you one, are one of the properties has deer. So So we've got a lot of people tuning in from Maryland. So that's wonderful. You guys will all learn so much today about choosing the right plants. That's what it's all about is the right plants for the right space. So let's jump in. Before we do that, let us know if you're looking out your window exactly how many deer you can see at this precise moment. <laughs> <laughs> because I feel like no matter where we are here in the Northeast, everyone has the deer issue. Why is that? Maybe um, who who wants to take this question first? That why do we seem to have so many deer here in the Northeast? Mm. That's a very good question. I think from from uh, everything that I know well enough, um, there there is no longer the the predator for for white-tailed deer. So it's also a very uh, different scenario now. The, the, the large uh, sections of woodland are gone and there's now a lot of disjunct uh, sections and, and the deer have no, in many areas, have no place to go except to our own landscapes and mm -hmm. gardens. And so, especially if we plant things they like, there's no reason for them to go anywhere else. <laughs> right. We've created a buffet for them here. So oh, yeah. we've pushed oh, yeah. them out of their spaces and give, given them a buffet right here in our yard. So I, you can't really blame them. Ruth, anything to yeah. add about why we are inundated? 
Well, I think a lot of it too is, as Greg mentioned about uh, so much um, building and so forth that's going on and has for many years now. But many times, um, I know I, I used to live in Westchester County, New York, which is overrun. It was a dear capital at one time and, and um, for Lyme disease as well, which is a serious, serious problem. But uh, very often you'd find that there was a, um, a a, a trail that they had been following for eons, I mean, forever. And when we moved into that particular house, we had a stream at the bottom of our yard. And then there were other places where they came in as well, to say nothing of before, before we moved in, we discovered that there was a whole driveway lined with hostas, which did certainly not dis discourage the deer from being there. So the only thing we could do really was to, um, you know, I was just absolutely crazy to get as many plants as I could and to test them against the particular herd that we had. Now, mind you, sometimes you'd see them marching down the road, which was not very much fun. But anyway, um, up there were other, other herds of deer all over. And one deer herd is not necessarily going to be eating the same things as the next deer herd. They're not that reliable. So we have to be really alert to what's going on. And um, there are certainly are plenty of them around. I know down here in Maryland, there are big signs that say deer corn, where they're feeding them for hunting, which does not do the gardener very much good. No, and you know, I've heard that about their path, that they tend to keep to the same path. Um, we've got a lot of people who are commenting. They can't see them right now, but they know that they're out there yeah. waiting, waiting for us to plant those hosta or some of their favorite plants. Um, and so I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, and they say, I haven't counted, but there are more deer here than people. So we we have quite a big population. Um, and so, of course, you mentioned, we know they eat our plants, and you mentioned Lyme disease. Is that why they're a problem? Are those the two big reasons why we don't want deer in our yards? Mm. Well, that traffic accidents, traffic accidents uh, are yeah, very bad. On the side, I've seen. I saw two um, coming to your house, Greg, on, over the weekend. I saw two deer, dead, and um, and they looked like they were pretty young. So um, you know that's sad, and it makes a mess. And um, but the Lyme is was much more serious until they found some you know medical things that would take care of it. But uh, going back to when my kids were little, um, they're middle aged now, but. Uh, there was there was a lot of deer there, and that was when the lime really exploded. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. So is that why you decided to do this book? I know at Homestead, this is one of the most like the top three questions. You know, right. give me some plants that deer won't eat. Is that why you know those those couple of reasons they eat our plants, the lime, the traffic accidents? You guys decided to do this book. What was the inspiration for you two? Oh, wow. It, well, it, it, was, <laughs> it was a couple of things and, and Ruth and I should should both chime in on this. Um, one of the one of the things that I really wanted to do, I've always been a native plant enthusiast my entire career, um, but I always wanted to write a book. And Ruth and I were having a wonderful conversation over dinner one night. And uh, I said, you know, it's a brilliant dream of mine to write a book. And she basically said, well, then why don't we? You know, why don't you? <laughs> why don't we? And uh, uh, she made that happen. But when we talked about the subject matter, um, after her success of the 50 um, deer resistant uh, uh, plants, um, th that was another one that um, it just it, it showed there was a lot of interest. And so um, I should let Ruth finish with that one. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's a very popular subject. Well, yeah, it really is. And actually, as a matter of fact, I, uh, I just heard from Timber Press that the, the uh, Beautiful Deer Resistant Plants book has sold over over 38,000 copies, which and is it was lot. just released a few months ago. That's a lot of deer. No, not this one. The previous oh, one. oh, the other one. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. huge. That, that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of deer. So, um, you know, when we moved into that house, as I was mentioning, it was I mean, I was desperate. And I said, well, I'm, I'm just not going to put up with this. It's ridiculous. You know, we didn't we couldn't afford to put a fence in. And then there was a stream to consider, you know, you can't go to bed at night knowing that you're denying the deer having a drink. <laughs> At least I can't. So anyway, it was there, you know, several different things, and plus I thought it was a really good, uh, a good topic, and it has proved to be. But when Greg and I were talking about it, uh, at that time I was on the board of Delaware Botanic Gardens, and of course Greg was working there, and we had deer um, that we were not fenced at that point, and uh, we had deer coming through, 
and the beautiful meadow, Pete Adolf meadow, uh, designed by Pete Matt Adolf, uh, was getting having trouble. I mean, we knew that the deer were coming through, so we had to really. We thought this was a good a good topic and timely. And um, but you know, we're not the only plot part of the country that has deer. There are different species in other places as well, and they have just as much trouble as we do. But I think maybe. Um, because we're sort of slap in the middle of them. <laughs> we're very, very aware of it. And I like to see now, I'm delighted to see that some of the garden centers and nurseries are signing up, you know, signing uh, plants that are, are deer resistant. That is a great step forward. And I would even like to see whole sections of nurseries with uh, deer resistant plants put in them. Even a display, yeah. you know, a display, a, 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 sort of, um, I don't know, a template, almost a, a, you know, plant plant by what you see at the nursery all put together. I mean, it would be just super. So. Well, we're going to get into some plant recommendations, but when you mentioned that about other areas of the country having different species, I, at least we don't have to deal with armadillos here right. in Pennsylvania. I can't imagine that. Um, <laughs> Yes, exactly, exactly. And I should mention that with at the top, but everyone who comments today, Timber Press and Ruth and Greg have been kind enough to give away a copy of their book. And so we will draw a winner randomly from the comments. You can comment as many times as you want. Every <laughs> comment is a chance to enter. And um, we'll randomly draw someone at the end of the chat after we close out. And um, we'll ship you a copy of their book. So please. We got the comments coming in. Great, thank you guys. Yeah, yeah. Excellent, um, Thanks, everyone. <laughs> so we're gonna get to plant recommendations in a minute, but um, you mentioned fencing. So I know people do fen eight foot fences. I know people put the grates along their driveways. Are you fans of those types of and repellents? Are you fans of those types of things as well, or do you think if you just plant for plants they don't like, then they they won't come? Mm. Well, it depends on where you are. If you've got a small residential garden, obviously that's not appropriate. But where Greg is, certainly. Go ahead, Greg. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, the the way that I've come to uh, discover how we deal with deer, um, I, I had had uh, clients years ago in Chester County, Pennsylvania. I had them in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. I had Maryland, Delaware, Southern Delaware. And so a lot of different issues um, that were coming up, obviously, with, with deer herbivory. And so <clears throat> I, I, I definitely experienced at Mount Cuba Center and Hocassin, where I worked, I experienced in a public garden uh, what deer were eating. I also experienced with clients that I had what the deer were eating and not eating. And so based upon that, we saw that there were some plants that even, even in the wintertime when they were really, really hungry, um, they rarely ever touched, if, if, if ever. Oh. And then there were some that you can guarantee, unless you use something like a repellent or a cage to keep them from eating it, it's, it was their favorite food. So what we're doing with the book is we're giving you plants that there are some that are way up on the, on the deer don't eat list. I mean, almost to 10 where they just won't Ooh. touch them. And then, then there's the scale goes down, but you can actually uh, help to keep deer away by applying repellents. And Ruth and I will certainly go into that. Um, and we're gonna just talk about a few that were effective uh, for, for in our experience. Great. So Greg, that you have used them, I mean, you use them much more than I do, but when um, when I was in, in uh, deer country up in New York, I used a product called Deer Scram. Uh, the problem is, First of all, I'm too lazy to bother to spray. I don't like to spray. And <laughs> so um, uh, Deer Scram is a granular product that you can, I used to go down, out into the garden where I had seen some damage perhaps and just throw it out like I was feeding the chickens. You know, it's easy, easy, easy. Um, and I, I didn't really keep too terribly close watch on it as to exactly how many days it was good for. It depended on the weather somewhat. But I think you said, Greg, you uh, reapply it about every month or so something like that it yeah it seemed it seemed like the efficacy on the granular repellent was um good for all, up to almost 30 days three weeks <laughs> right, right smell is a big one yeah it, it's it's the deer they deer have acute senses of smell and so when they smell these repellents they just want nothing to do with what's nearby them so 
that granular is is just awesome. I know you've used it, Ruth, in in New York. Right. I've right. used it at my many clients. And one of the other things I found is Deer Scram um, actually helped with many other like I had problems with groundhogs and rabbits, and many many of those uh, critters were also kept at bay with this product. So. so Marie is asking, and I didn't want to bring it up, but Marie did. Is there human urine in these repellents? Is that what's repelling them? Do we know the smell? Oh, okay, okay. So yeah, so if we if we get into the nitty gritty of repellents, um, they're the urine products. Um, they're typically coyote urine. Okay. Or some type of animal <laughs> urine. That's what that's what they are. And the thing with them is they they are effective depending upon how strong a smell they produce. Right. And when you put them down fresh, they don't have anything that keeps the rain from washing them off. And after just a couple of days, that stronger smell goes away. And the deer, if they're hungry enough and they keep coming back, they go, oh, I don't think that coyote has been here in five days. Let's let's have dinner. Got so, it. Yeah, uh, I had a, when, I've, I've, excuse me. Go ahead. And that's on urine but, products, on the urine products. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But but I'm I'm butting in here because I had I yeah, used to go sure. out to see the National Flower Show in April every year, which is not doing any longer. But I used to go out and have a um, a sort of question and answer session, and people would come, and I I knew this lady out there who was getting up in years, I should say. And she said, oh, I've never had, never, ever had any deer problems at all. My husband goes out every night and walks the perimeter, works the perimeter of their property and pees all the way, all the way while he's out. And now he's gone and the deer are everywhere. <laughs> That's <laughs> one tactic. Yes, if you want to try yep. that, I mean, people do. So what can I tell yeah. you? <laughs> well, I we want to get into plant recommendations, but there are two more questions about repellents. I know sure. this is a really hot topic. So one is, yeah. um, is deer scram organic? Do you know? Uh, I so, think you yeah, yeah it's ahead. it's it's basically it's it's pet friendly. Um, it's something the cat, your cat and and dog are not going to like the smell of either. It's it will repel them, but it it works on scent and with almost all animals that have acute sense of smell. Um, uh, especially deer, it just is a smell they don't like. Like we come up to something like horseradish and go, whoa, it's very much, it's all about the smell and mm -hmm. the freshness of the smell. Mm -hmm. So Ruth had mentioned deer scram, which is a great repellent um, granular. You can keep it in a bucket or a cup and sprinkle it. But the other one I like is deer stopper. And deer stopper is a concentrated uh, repellent. It actually comes in as much as two and a half gallon uh, jugs on, on Amazon. So it's mixed with water. So you mix one part of this repellent with uh, nine parts of the water. And it is also organic because it's just emulsified eggs, mm. mint oil, and rosemary oil. And when you spray it, it smells really good. <clears throat> and then the next day, you can't smell it, but the deer can because the eggs help it stick onto the plant. Um, and I've had problems with buck rub. That's a big one too that we have to deal with in private gardens and public gardens. And I've sprayed deer stopper on trees and have found some, I have to say, some um, really good results by using the, the deer stopper sprayed on trees to keep from buck rubbing. Um, and and just, it's, a, it's really a, a light mist. You could use if you have a big area to cover, you could use a backpack sprayer and you mix it up and you're spraying and it smells good. Um, it's safe, again, safer for uh, critters as well as, as uh, pets and humans. Um, but you can also, um, Ruth and I've talked about this many times, bringing out a backpack sprayer once a week or once every two or three weeks, it's still a lot of work. So I buy these ones on Amazon that are these little tiny um, hand pump sprayers that you just put the uh, it's it only holds a small amount but every time I'm out there weeding I just I just randomly will will put the spray out you don't need a great deal mm -hmm. but if you do it regularly mm -hmm. keep applying that's the number one thing and, but, and the, I'm sorry I should say deer stopper its efficacy period is is uh, up to 30 days 
Yeah, Not bad. Cool. Now, one yeah. more question, and then we're going to move on from repellents, you guys. And you can come back, and you can always find <laughs> Luke and Greg, sure. or go to Homestead, and you can ask. They have a huge section. I was just there a couple weeks ago good. of deer mm -hmm. repellents. Mm -hmm. um, and now we've got three questions. Jennifer just tuned in as well about Irish Spring. So <laughs> yes, right, right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Is Ruth, it effective? Ever, uh, well, um, I'll certainly answer. And Ruth, have you used it as well? I, well, I think I did in New York maybe many, many, many years ago. Not that I've learned a little bit more about it. I mean, I think all these things do, they do help. And, you know, some people swear by it. If it works for you, go for it. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend that as the be all and end all of everything with, with saving your plants from deer. Yeah, it's, it, it is, it's, it's effective, but in order to apply it in the amounts that you need to apply it, Right. I'd, I'd be buying out the super, you know, the, the grocery stores of Irish uh, spring. Yeah. So the smell, again, is what's repelling them. It's just a right. smell they don't like. So yeah. remember, smell is the number one thing. Put in plants they don't like the smell of, put in repellents they don't like the smell of, and you're going to see a big difference. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, before all of this repellent talk, um, we had a bunch of talks about how appreciative people were that your book focused on native. So Greg, I'm going to throw this one to you and talk about why. I mean, you already mentioned, you said you wanted to write a book and you you do have a native background and expertise in those. But why did you think it was important to focus on natives in this book? Well, um, this was something that Ruth and I agreed on early on. A, a big part of the, the, the garden missions focus at Delaware Botanic Gardens, um, which I helped create, was, was with native plants and, and just um, supporting the message, say, from people like Dr. Uh, Doug Tallamy that say this are, are literally our, our uh, healthy ecology depends on it. So um, I, I happen to love native plants because they are beautiful and because they're unique to a to sense of place. I like that idea. But the more that I have, of course, learned about how supportive they are of uh, their ecological role of um, providing uh, food for not only um, um, insects, which is huge, but but in turn also in turn for uh, birds and other mammals. And I think it's birds that are probably the really impacted by the uh, native plants and and the insects they attract. So so that made it made sense to to do that. And there's not a lot of information out there about uh, native plants as far as how they how you deal with the deer. There's a lot of messages about use them so so it made it made sense and again with ruth's uh experience with her previous book um we just uh, basically narrowed in on plants that we knew in our experience that deer uh did not prefer mm -hmm. yeah. so i love that so we'll get into a few of the re recommendations so ruth your book has a deer rating and greg alluded to this a little bit earlier tell us about how we can use the book and what that deer rating rating means well, the deer, deer rating is not, it's from our own experience. It's not super scientific or anything like that. But we thought that it was helpful um, to, to give an, an idea to people who are reading. You know, if a, if a deer is, it, 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 the scale is from one to 10. There is nothing in there that's under seven. So that rules out a lot of things that are deer candy. Yes. And so, um, so we when if you have something that is, uh, say a seven, it might be seven to eight or seven to nine, depending on where you live, depending on the time of the year. They'll go for much softer growth than they will after it's gotten a little bit woody, you know, as it gets older. Mm -hmm. um, so you might have them taking the flower buds off and and chewing on those, and so often they spit them out again, which is very irritating. But anyway. Um, you know, they're they're going to be coming in uh, fairly often. Very often, you just won't have any any flowers at all because they come up and they're beautiful. And whoops, one day you go out and they're gone. But then, if you've got something that is say nine to ten, means they seldom go. They seldom browse. They will sometimes. Don't ever say never. There is nothing that is a ten period. Nothing because you know life is you know, problematic. So um, you have to um, just go from that scale. It, it's just an indicator and a pointer to, to alert you to the fact that, yes, you might very well um, get deer problems here. But um, if you've got other plants that are cl planted close by that, are, let's say something like, and I, I 
jumping the gun maybe, but if I mention something like yarrow or achillea, it is very seldom uh, eaten, by, eaten by deer because they don't like, again, it's aroma of the foliage. But so if you have something that is a little iffy, maybe around a seven and put some achillea right close next to it, you might, you know, that might deter them a little bit, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a game. You really, you have to think like a deer and see what you can do about it. There's, there are no guarantees except barbed wire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what can I tell uh, you? So that's a tactic. Let's let's talk about some other tactics. So number one is planting deer resistant plants. Number two is, well, barbed wire or other ways that you can keep them out. What about other suggestions like planting them closer to the house? I have tulips, but they are right by my front door. And so they're rarely bothered by the deer in my neighborhood. I know some deer will come in the house if invited, uh, <laughs> but, you know, planting them close to the house and planting, surrounding them with other deer resistant plants. That's a great suggestion. Are there any other tactics you can think of that might keep the deer away from some of those sixes, those six or five numbered plants? Yeah, um, <laughs> Sure, sure. Um, I'll tell you exactly what I do. I've done it many of the public gardens for my private clients. Um, I just, I don't, I know plants that are deer resistant, but if I'm going to be going out and spraying or sprinkling uh, the uh, uh, the deer scram, um, I, I figure it, it's just a part of the process of gardening. Mm -hmm. It's another mm -hmm. step. I don't yeah. fertilize any of the native plants. Instead, I use my time putting deer stopper or, or a yeah. deer uh, repellent down of some sort. And so, um, but you can absolutely grow things that the deer would otherwise devour. Um, you can, you can help. It's a combination strategy of knowing your plants, mm -hmm. knowing the time the deer might eat them. If they are something that they might nibble on, sometimes mm -hmm. it'll be the early spring growth. Sometimes uh, it'll be just the flowers. So, um, and then combine it with the repellents. And let me tell you, where I am in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, the deer um, density there, as it's known, is is one uh, for every acre. There's about 30 deer. That's a lot of deer. Wow. Yeah, the same in Chester County. Yes. So in Pennsylvania. Yeah. So with that said, that's what I've been doing. I've been I've been just coming choosing the right plants and non-native plants as well. But for many of our areas, um, it's 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 the plants and the repellents. Yep. Yeah. And um, Jennifer is saying that large Labradors work at her house. So that's certainly <laughs> sure they do. Yeah, yes. that's great. Bring that's on great. the bring on the puppy dogs. I, I agree. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I have to tell you there. I know of a garden, a friend of mine who lived in in Oakton um, and she and her husband have a tiny little tiny little dog. That dog um, literally chases <laughs> and scares the deer away. I don't know how it does it, but I, I highly recommend Little it. dogs usually Go. have the biggest head. So, yes. um, and Marie is asking about eggshells. I don't know if she's asking about eggshells as a repellent. I've never heard of that. Uh, okay. So, so really from what I understand, eggshells, uh, basically it's, if there's egg inside, it does uh, help um, to repel because the deer don't like the smell of the eggs. Anything that's organic, like a, a, a urine product, a blood product, something like that, they stay away from the animal. Oh, um, interesting. Thing. Yeah. So, um, so that might be what it is in, in the one other repellent it's mixed in as emulsified eggs with the mint and rosemary, and it actually helps it stick to the leaf surface. So, um, but that's, that, that could also be just something um, that is animal related that the deer shy away from. I thought, Marie, you might be throwing them at the deer. If you have chickens, you probably have enough to give away. But all right, well, let's jump into plant recommendations. I know I've pulled a few pictures. Whatever you guys want to talk about is fine. Um, but why don't we go back and forth and you can each tell us some of your favorite plants, those native plants. Remember, we're here talking about Greg and Ruth's new book, Deer Resistant Native Plants for the Northeast, and they've been kind enough to do a giveaway. And so for every person who comments, if you're just joining us, you're entered in a chance to win this great book, Timber Press. So um, who wants to, Ruth, you want to kick us off? Sure. Uh, just really before we get too much into the individual plants, I did want to mention, or maybe we will towards the end, about cultural situation too, cultural uh, things that you can do that do deter them or guarantee that they'll come. So either one. But um, 
Greg is is has all these wonderful uh, yellow daisies that flower in the summer that are native that he loves. So I'll leave him to talk about those definitely. But um, one of my favorite ones, and he always laughs at me. Um, I have uh, penstemons. Penstemons they don't usually go for. There's penstemon uh, digitalis or the foxglove beard tongue. That's one that I like a lot. Um, yarrows, uh, acalea that we talked about briefly before. They are really just fabulous, and there are lots of, in different colors, not in blue, but in, in other colors as well now, uh, and different sizes. You can get them, uh, different. They, they'll take full sun, they don't mind drought, they're easy to grow, and the deer leave them alone. I mean, what more can you want? Yeah. <laughs> so you've got, you know, a lot of things like that. Um, uh, just, oh, um, the one that I, is my favorite favorite that comes out towards the end of the season is the uh, is set Mar Maryland Senna. And that's the one that Greg always teases me about because it's enormous to begin with. It gets, last year, I think mine was probably between six and seven feet tall and I'm about five, five. So it was towering over me, but it put on such a wonderful display. It's one of the, the pea family, the legumes, and there are a number of things in that family that they don't go for. Also in terms of family, families, they seldom go for grasses or for sedges or for ferns. Once in a while, you can't guarantee it. But those are, and then the poppy family, they seldom go for. So you've got a lot of things to choose from. It's just a question of doing a little bit of research. And I know Greg's got all his daisies he wants to talk about. Well, we asked Ruth to pick three, and I think that was 30, but there's a whole book of them. How many, how many plants are in the book? Um, about well, 75 or so main ones, and then a lot of companion plants as well that we're suggesting and recommending that people try from a design standpoint. Wonderful. And Sarah, we will post um, a, a list of the plants that we discussed today, but of course, you get the book and you'll have all of the plants with pictures. And I'm sure there's a lot of other information in the book about the plants as Ruth just alluded to some companion planting ideas. So, um, and we've just posted some. So Matt Ross is joining us. You guys might like to know uh, Matt yes. from Longwood. Hey Matt, uh, good hey, to see Matt. you. Um, all right, Greg, you're up. What do you think? All right. Uh, so, so this is a, the, the daisies that uh, Ruth was alluding to. Um, it just so happens that I like plants that happen to be composite and she was poking fun at me. Um, but um, there are so many, there's so many good, there really are so many good plants that as you can imagine, it's tough to pick your favorites, but I just know that there's some that the deer just don't eat. So I'm delighted with that. The first one, Coreopsis. Coreopsis is rarely ever eaten by deer. Mm. Sometimes they may uh, nibble on the new uh, flowers, but typically, I don't see them ever touching it. And there are so many different types of uh, Coreopsis. You'll see in our book, we focus on one species, but we list many other species. And just in Coreopsis alone, you're going to find a good, I'm going to say, six to seven plants that you can use uh, and be deer, deer uh, resistant effectiveness. Maybe. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, another one, a, a plant, it can be on the bigger side uh, for many gardens, but the deer just don't bother it, is what's known as sylphium. Uh, sylphium is a, tends to be, as I said, a larger size plant for some gardens. But if you find the right sylphium, there are some that don't spread uh, voraciously. They, they actually are clump formers. So sylphium is another one. Again, a composite flower. Just now really Vicky's cool. asking, is sylphium a full sun or shade or part? So good question. So sylphium is definitely full sun, more uh, meadow, but you could put it in a perennial border and it'll do beautifully. It blooms for a long period of time, which I'm thinking too, not only do I want uh, plants that the deer aren't going to devour. I want plants that are going to feed pollinators and, and other insects, especially uh, wasps, uh, which uh, along with our bumblebees are very important pollinators. So we need those. Um, and every time we put in a native plant that supports a pollinator, we're helping ecology. So it's, that's a big one. Um, yeah. So, so those are, um, those are uh, two, two that I absolutely love, but we haven't spoken anything about plants that um, do well in shade, and there are deer-resistant shade yeah. plants. One that's blooming right now. It's a great time to have it in the garden, and it it looks just spectacular in a rock garden, in a woodland. I know you're saying, what is it, Greg? It's <laughs> Aquilegia canadensis, which is our red columbine. So this is another one of those little plants that 
boy, when you tuck it into the right sections of the garden, you're so glad to have this wonderful red and yellow in, in the month of, of April and early May in the garden. So those are, those are three that I just, just really adore. I love it. Thank you. Um, Lisa is saying how much she loves this presentation and she asks that your next book be about vole resistant natives. <laughs> we need vole, groundhog, and deer, deer, and rabbit resistant native plants. It would be right? a whole series. That would right. be, yeah, yep, yeah, that's um, totally. Yeah. And uh, Thomas Hawkins is saying, Greg and Ruth, you just made my lunch break. That he's in a client's deer damaged garden in Newtown Square right now. Oh, really? That's Tomas, probably. Newtown yeah. Square, yes, exactly. I, hi, Thomas. My gosh, yes, there's. There's a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of good stuff. We could, we we definitely have to delve into more. How much time do we have, Katie? I mean, I know, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, well, we you gave me some great shrub recommendations, Greg. So I'm going to pull up the pictures of those because we also just had someone ask about some shrubs. Um, I or Eileen was very specific. Shrub recommendations for next to a brick wall that faces southwest in full sun and clay soil. But that's the great thing about Eileen about natives is that they are going to perform best in your types of soil. So um, do you think those shrubs that you pulled up that you sent to me, Greg, would be good for Eileen for these recommendations? Yeah, we can, we can, if you want to, uh, if there, there's a way we can take a look at them. Um, we can, uh, Ruth and I can both give you some information on each one and I'll be happy to, if I think it's going to be south facing uh, aspect up against a brick wall, it's, it sounds like there's going to be a lot of heat, uh, radiant yes. heat and clay. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see which one's the best in that. Um, um, and then she's got to get in line at Homestead and right, and, you know. right. Because all of these specifically, you know, they are in Greg and Ruth's book, and they are at Homestead Garden. So this was the Arrowwood, I think, the Viburnum. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Right. Is this going to be one of those? You think it's more heat tolerant? I would doubt it. Yeah. Okay. I would like to give it, no, I don't think it'll like to be baked in the summertime. It's in the summertime when it gets very hot and tends to be dry. I'm not sure, I'd bring it out a little bit if you can, away from where it's gonna get radiant heat from the from the building. But certainly, I mean, it's a beautiful shrub and one that is in bloom, coming into bloom, you know, if it's not already flowering, it's pretty soon. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy it a lot. So, um, you know, this is one, but not for that particular situation, but clay soil can always be improved, of course, with the addition of compost and so on and so forth. It's a question of, a cul of culture, but um, a lot of people do have trouble where it tends to be wet. And mm -hmm. uh, that's, yeah. that's a difficulty that they encounter. Mm -hmm. All with, right, so we, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say with the, with the viburnum, um, it's a it's a shade tolerant plant. It, it's, a, it's a woodland viburnum. That's what it that's what it is. However, if you want it to flower heavily, you can put it in sun. But as Ruth mentioned, it just doesn't like uh, to be too dry and too much heat. But I've been very surprised at, at these woodland shrubs that I have always seen growing in the woods like viburnum dentatum acerifolium. They do beautifully in the sun. Um, and it just, it depends on their moisture level, I think. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So. Well, all you shade people out there who are looking for something, try this Arrowwood Viburnum. All right. You, you yep. saw this. This is one of my favorites. This is beauty berry and look at those berries. Unbelievable. Why do you guys love this? Well, it's, I mean, it really is a nice plant. Mine are, I was just actually doing some pruning this weekend and, and did a little bit of tidying up on my plants. And uh, the, the leaves are just starting to break. So it, it was not going to give you a display like this until towards the end of the summer. Don't expect it to be looking like this for Memorial Day. But um, certainly it, the flowers are, I would say, relatively inconspicuous but um, pink, pink flowers. Uh, and you can see here that they're uh, at the nodes where the leaf, leaves come out. It's a very nice plant that will stand you in good stead, does not require a lot of care. It take, will take uh, sunshine, or I found it'll take part shade as well. Uh, perhaps doesn't uh, bury up quite as much, but it's really an attractive plant. And uh, you can get ones with uh, white berries as well, but the purple are quite dramatic because they come in late in the season with a lot of the fall blooming asters and things like that. And it can be really, mm -hmm. Pretty. And the deer don't go for it. I mean, even in New York where I lived, they didn't eat it. So <laughs> it was um, it was just 
what I had one that was right on the driveway, so it was a little bit shaded there, and it did perfectly well. So this is a this is a shrub. It, again, it's called American Beautyberry, Calicarpa americana. Uh, someone had asked about that. Uh, beautiful, as you can see, the magenta berries. Interestingly, it also is a plant that is a shrub that is helpful in repelling ticks. They don't like the Ooh. smell. So this is something to consider. It will grow in shade. It doesn't bury at flower and bury as much in shade, but it will grow. Um, we used it at Mount Cuba Center. We used it at Delaware Botanic Gardens. And um, the, the, the leaves have a, a type of aroma that I wouldn't say is necessarily really attractive, but it's, it's, um, it's, you can literally crush a leaf and, and kind of rub it on your, on your neck, and it does help repel ticks. Wow. But, Easy, easy shrub. I've never, it's, it, it does seems to do well in clay. It does well in drier, uh, sloped, uh, sun. Yeah. Wow. So, yep. Yeah. I, I forgot to mention that it also has beautiful yellow fall color. Yes. Mm. Dude, I mean, yep. it, really spectacular. So that's something to remember. If you can wait through the end of, end of summer going into the fall, you're, you're going to be rewarded. Well, you yep. can wait. Um, speaking of, of, Four seasons of interest. This is one of my favorites. We see that that a lot of um, I call this red twig dogwood, but you guys called it. What's the real name of it? Oh, yeah, that, that's a that's a that's a common Corn. name. Red twig. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Red osier is another one people call. Yeah, we've used that. But yeah. Yep. And there's also yellow twig, right? So the both of those would be natives. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those that, in my experience when the deer are really hungry, they will go after this. So, okay. well, I guess now, yeah, this is, this really is, it, it, it depends on your area, but um, I've also found buck rub, that bucks love to rub up against the shrub. So again, I use the deer stopper and I'm, I, we, we cage some of ours at the cemetery, but the ones that weren't caged that, that got the deer stopper, this, this, um, and I did it once a month through the winter They've never, they didn't even buck rub. They didn't touch. So, so that's a big plus, but great plant, wonderful uh, cut, full sun, loves really wet, can tolerate wet, almost um, uh, heavy clay soils. It does, it will, it will do well in those kind of soils. And as Ruth recommended, uh, uh, if it's a very heavy clay, obviously uh, add some organic material. Um, that's important compost, well, well rotted compost. Yeah. Well, Eileen, maybe this would be great, especially up against a red brick wall, how this red would pop. And if it can tolerate that clay soil that you're going to amend, right, Eileen? Um, <laughs> or even like red, then a yellow and a red, then a yellow. I think that would be really yeah. pretty. And 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 also to Eileen, uh, the Calicarpa, the American Beautyberry we look, just looked at, that is from the southeast. So it thrives in the heat and humidity of summertime. So you actually might be uh, cho with choosing this shrub, you might actually may may have something that's happier in your conditions than it might mm. be in others. So mm. yeah. let's see what's next. More fall color that we're talking about the choke berry. And I do want to note, Marty, you asked earlier the name of the berry plant. These are not edible berries for people that we're talking about. Those would probably likely be devoured by the deer. Anything that's edible for people, uh, but they're great for the birds, right? These are things. Anything that has the name berry in it. Ruth and Greg is something that's great for our birds. Yeah. I, I found that the berries on the beauty berry are not usually taken until after Christmas time. They, uh, they hang on for quite a long time and then uh, the uh, starch in them turns to sugar a little bit and then they're much more palatable to, to birds uh, right in, in the dead of winter. They're usually shot. I mean, they're gone. Like, you know, one yeah. day thing all of a sudden they discover them and they're gone so um they're not no definitely don't give them to your toddler <laughs> and many many of the uh winter ber uh, berries that do persist through the winter are high in fat and a mm -hmm. lot of the um a lot of the birds that are staying for the winter uh, depend on that even those that are uh, migrating um mm -hmm. like the the high fat berries um so they're um usually you'll see the summer berries are the ones that will be um, like blueberries, of course, deer love blueberries, um, but uh, things like the uh, the aronia, that's the birds will eat. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's that's one that definitely is, is more of a um, definitely a, a bird. The right right size berry, too. Mm -hmm. um, 
is is another one something that once it's ready they can quickly down it and and, right. and move yeah right could i make just add something to the to the red twig dog word we just mentioned um i know greg had said that sometimes the deer will go for that they usually go after the new growth. Once the once the twigs have have um, hardened up and become tougher, they only have one set of teeth, so they can't chomp on something as we would. And so um, they will, as the twigs get woodier, they are much more difficult for them to eat. But a lot of people I know, because the red twigs are so pretty, will prune down or stool prune them right down almost to the ground and take all of the st stems off to encourage new growth to come up, which has the best bark color. Mm -hmm. And so when you've got that, all that soft growth coming up, you know, it's like invitation, come and get it. Yeah. So um, that's, you maybe want to reconsider your, your pruning and, um, you know, have fewer new wood coming up every year if you're not going to protect them with, with um, repellents or something. Yeah. Great tip. And for for Vicky that was asking about, she said her deer devoured the red twigs. Um, I would highly recommend, even in the wintertime, applying the deer stopper. Um, it, it, it's it's worth it because um, we depend on those. Um, we really do depend on those for winter uh, interest in the garden. So it's well worth the extra effort to spray. Well, I feel like we have given so many tips. We, I take some credit for this. You guys have given so many great tips. We're rounding yeah. out, coming to an hour. And Ruth, I know you mentioned something about cultural applications. So I wanted to make sure we got into that. You alluded to it a little bit by making sure that we're amending our soil. But before we wrap up, and you guys, this is your last chance to get in your questions before we wrap. But Ruth, do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, yes, I would like to. One thing that I discovered quite by accident or from... Uh, pure laziness was that in the summertime when it's really hot and I do not I do not irrigate by and large I don't I mean I plant stuff I get the soil looking pretty good plant stuff and it's got to go from there you're on your own so I don't go around watering all the time however I did discover and it makes perfect sense that if uh, the plants are really dry, the soil is really dry, then undoubtedly the deer are going to be thirsty. I mean, we're thirsty. Mm -hmm. We're going out with a water bottle all the time. You know, undoubtedly the, the deer are going to be thirsty. So I discovered that if, um, which wasn't, it wasn't exactly world peace, but anyway, um, I discovered that if I watered, say, at four in the afternoon or something like that, later than that, and the, the pl plants did not dry off, I mean, if you're, if you're watering from an overhead particularly, you can guarantee the deer will be there that night because there's water right, waiting right for them on the plants and they're yes. going to devour whatever. And that's something. So if you're going to water, I would say water in the morning for sure. So the plants can really dry off. And I prefer to, to water at ground level rather than overhead. That's just another, another tip that I discovered. So uh, things like that. Another thing that I discovered, which was not Again, <laughs> these things are so logical when you think them through and discover what happened. Um, you know, people have uh, lawn companies, obviously, that come to take care of their lawns and stuff. So you'll have a beautiful perennial border or mixed border, for example, edged by, you know, beautifully kept grass and stuff like that. Of course, it's being fertilized and it's being watered. And so you get very soft growth that re results. It spreads over into the beds, into the soil. And so you've got young growth there and it's soft. And boy, it's just a sitting duck for the deer to come and have a meal. It's little things like that really do make a lot of difference. And you'll find that if you cut down on the fertilizer, for example, um, you know, maybe you'll have to talk to your lawn people. I don't know. But um, it is over over fertilizing tends to produce soft growth in perennials, of course, uh, particularly. And so the stems are very soft. They're not they Sometimes they'll need to be staked even because they won't hold their heads up properly. But they're absolutely sitting ducks for, for deer to coming in and devouring them to so say nothing oh, about Labrador sitting in the patch. <laughs> well, a quick question back to your watering about the deer. Would you put have you ever put out water for deer? I don't want them to come. No, yeah, I didn't think so. Marty, you have such a big heart, I suppose, but uh, maybe you're putting it in your neighbor's yard. I'm not sure where you're putting it, but. <laughs> I like to I like to take a whole bunch of, um, you know, impatience or something like that as my next door neighbor as a gift and say, well, you know, here and then the deer will follow. 
whatever works. It doesn't matter. You know, it's, there's. Uh, it doesn't make you a good person or a bad person. No, no, <laughs> no. We don't want to. You know, we're not trying to harm them. We're just trying to deter them, repel exactly. them. Do you know? This is the second question we got. Cicadas are obviously the hot topic of the moment. Do you know if deer eat cicadas? No, they don't eat meat, right? No, they're they're uh, herbivores. They all right. eat plants. Yes, yep. right, yes. right, right. Yeah. Dogs, though, I did back to those Labrador retrievers. I heard that dogs will eat cicadas. They will eat them. Yep. They play <laughs> with them. Cats will play with them and eat them. I've seen that, too. Yeah. We're not where I am in Philadelphia area here. We're not in that section where all the so the cicadas. But I hear Delaware and Maryland. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yes, be. They're getting. Yep. We had a very popular topic on it, actually, last uh, Monday. And we had lots of questions from people about specifically about eating them. Apparently, we can eat them, too. People. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, I won't be going there. I just... No, me neither. <laughs> uh, we have one last very specific question. And if, if you guys need to think about it or make a recommendation to get your book, um, Vicki's asking about something for the shade that would spread, maybe a low growing ground cover that is evergreen. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yep. So um, there's actually, uh, there's several that you can choose from. It depends on your, again, your, your, your um, cultural conditions. Uh, what is it? Well-drained soil. Is it dry? Is it, is it, is it sunny? Is it shady? You know, and how much shade, how much sun? Um, but one thing off, just off the top of my head, I can think of is, is Chrysogonum, Virginianum. Mm -hmm. um, that's green and gold. Um, it tends to be, um, it can be in, especially zone seven and south, it can be uh, evergreen. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's one to consider. Also, you could use sedges. Um, mm -hmm. There are quite a few of our sedges are evergreen. Um, now in the wintertime, when the deer are really stressed, they may nibble on them. It's not their preference, but if you can give them a couple sprays, uh, sedges work really well in the shade and really well um, in dry shade. There's quite a few. So um, I'm trying to think anything else that you can think of, Ruth. Well, I would say if it's not too dry, I would say things like Christmas fern uh, that will stay evergreen through the winter time. And uh, you know that there are several ferns. Uh, sedges, I think, are probably one of the best best ones. Greg, uh, as you mentioned before, hookers, coral bells, those can you can be uh, used. Uh, there are uh, quite a number of things, and you might want to mix and match and have sort of a patchwork. You know, I would su suggest, well, mention to you anyway. I have a huge uh, uh, American beech in my backyard, and the green and gold did not like that. So, um, you know, you have to try, it's trial and error. And uh, if you've got black walnuts, for example, you'll have another problem. So, you know, life is not that easy, but it's lots of fun. Yep. <laughs> and there's books and people like Ruth and Greg to help. <laughs> you bet. Anytime, anytime, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, well, thank you. That covered, I think, lots of questions and lots of thank yous from everybody for all of your help. Um, this is such a hot topic. As a reminder, we will be drawing right after this a um, winner from the comments to win a copy of Greg and Ruth's new book, Deer Resistant Native Plants for the Northeast. And if you aren't one of our lucky winners, don't worry, you can pick it up at your local bookstore or online at various online retailers. So please do look for it and um, bookmark the pages and look at the deer ratings and all the neat ways that they've organized the chapters. And we thank you so much for all of your expertise, Greg and Ruth. This has been a lot of fun to chat with you sure and everybody is, is so grateful for your expertise as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you everybody for watching. Yes. We're really glad you, we could be here. Thanks, Katie. Thank you. And I will be back. Um, what's next Monday's date? April 19th already. Oh my goodness. Um, with a chicken expert, Brad from Coop Dreams. He's going to be sharing some tips on raising chickens and goats, and he's got all the all fun kinds of animals. So please join us next uh, Monday, April 19th at noon. And of course, thank you to Homestead Gardens and all of our Garden Rewards members. We couldn't do this without you. So thank you so much, Greg and Ruth. We'll say goodbye for now and see you soon. See you soon. Thank you. Right, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.